all, it's Kia Ray. Um, coming to you all from the actual office of um, Nicholas and Moore Surgical Group. I'm so excited. I'm having my consult today and surgery tomorrow. And I'm just excited. This is where the journey begins. And I'm taking you all along with me. So come along. Understand you've been speaking with Ashley on the phone about things? Yes. Okay, great. And she's been my she, main contact person. She's been awesome. Yeah, good to hear. She's usually fantastic with most patients. She is, she is. So the, and I know why you're here, but I need to hear from you in your words. What are you here to see me for? What's bothering you? Um, well, I have MRKH, and I am here for the, I don't really know how to pronounce it, so maybe you can help me with this. I've always been saying the Davido neovaginal yeah. procedure. Davido or Davidoff, yeah. What have you been told as far as what your options are for a for your situation? Well, I did dilation for about a year and a half, um, stopped and then started back up for another couple of months. And then after that, I just was straight on the surgical route. I didn't want to do it anymore. It didn't work for me. Do you think they, they stretch yourself at all? No, I didn't. And do you have any other concurrent problems that uh, associated with your MRKH? Any other situations or problems that you're aware of? Well, I have scoliosis, so I did have my back surgery in 2008. I think it was 2008. Um, so after that, I haven't had many problems with it, but I still have to wear a brace, and I still have some back pains occasionally. No hearing problems, ear loss, or anything, any but. Um, malformations or any problems with your hands or your fingers or anything, okay. We have women that have a condition that for that they think they have MRKH, and it's not MRKH, but it's exactly the same situation, but they are 46XY. Mm -hmm. They look, being typically, as we say, what they look like is just like women, right. but it's called androgen insensitivity syndrome. So it's a whole different situation. And the reason why it's so important and even pediatric gynecologists sometimes don't understand why it's important. Mm -hmm. If you are 46XY, what you have inside are not ovaries, but testicular tissue. Okay. And when testicular tissue is inside the body, there's an increased rate of testicular cancer. So we need to remove, in your situation with ovaries, you right. keep that. We don't want to remove it okay. unless we have to, right? Okay. Let's cross our fingers for a while. Okay. So, Anything else you think I need to know at this point before we do the exam? Okay. Well, Heidi's going to listen to your heart and your lungs and all, but I'm going to just do an exam below. Okay. I'm not going to put you through a lot of stress here because I understand from doing hundreds of these surgeries, usually we have a small lined ended pouch, as we say. It's not a full length vagina. Mm -hmm. And what am I really, only thing I want to accomplish here is to see what type of structures you have on the outside see how deep the pouch is to see where we're going to start from, okay? okay. All right. I'm not going to put you through a lot of pain, I promise. I okay. It's a long time. I want to make this very clear. When we're done with the surgery, 99.9% .9 of the time, we are able to give you a full-length vagina starting place, which usually means it's more than 10 to 12 centimeters. But, but the success rate of the operation is not when we complete the surgery. The success 
is after you do your job too. Like and that, and it's not so much that you can, you're doing now like stretching or dilating, but you're keeping it from shrinking down as much. Mm-hmm. Our success rate falls more in the ninety-seven percent range at that point. I know when I'm done with the surgery with ninety-nine point nine percent certainty, you will have the capability of maintaining that area. And we want to maintain it to give you a full length vagina. Mm-hmm. So, but there's still a one out of thirty-three percent, one out of thirty-three chance that it may not work out. So that's why we've even started using what's called seated dilators because I believe if you sit on them, mm-hmm. there's more of a chance it's going to go all the way in. Yeah. Because I can't imagine trying to take a dilator and pushing this like this. That's got to be harder than if you sit. Then you slowly set your weight on it, and you know there's a better chance you're penetrating the full length. Yeah. So we just started using the seated dilators about the last four weeks. Mm-hmm. And what I think it's of, are they glass? I had those dilators when I first started, but they were glass dilators, and I think that's what it really. Oh no, me. these are actually acrylic. Okay. And they actually piece together, and you put various parts together, and make them from this big height to that height. So it's kind of a neat thing. We go over all of that two days after the surgery. So I don't want to put you through too much stress now. All right, we'll get that done after surgery, okay? Okay. All right, so let's walk you to the exam room. You okay? Yeah. All right, there you go. Now, you're going to feel me touch on the leg and gently on the bottom. That's the worst of it right there. You really have very little dimpling at all here. Less than a centimeter. 